My name is Adina Roskies. I'm a professor in the departments of philosophy and psychological and brain sciences at Dartmouth College. And I'm going to talk to you today about philosophy of neuroscience and neurophilosophy. The main question that we're going to talk about is how do philosophy and neuroscience intersect? Must, many of you might be puzzled because you might think that philosophy and neuroscience are about as far apart as disciplines could possibly be. Uh, but what I'll tell you about today is the ways in which they do interact um, in very fruitful ways, as we'll see in the later uh, elements of this video. So let's start with philosophy. What is philosophy? This is a really difficult question that even philosophers have had problems in answering. But we'll start with the general idea that it's an enterprise geared toward figuring out what things to believe. Lots of different disciplines are aimed at figuring out things to believe. The sciences in particular are figuring out things about the natural world, how to, what things are true about the natural world. But unlike the sciences, philosophy's scope is as broad as human inquiry. It's the most ancient of disciplines, and in fact, it used to subsume the sciences, which were called natural philosophy. One thing that distinguishes philosophy from the sciences is that it has a methodological commitment to reasoned argument. And traditionally, it's eschewed other kinds of investigations. Uh, so the traditional form of philosophy has really been aimed at the analysis of concepts or other kinds of uh, thought experiments that could be performed from the armchair. However, more recently, philosophy has added various empirical techniques in what has been called experimental philosophy or empirical philosophy. Another thing that distinguishes philosophy is that it tends to operate at an abstract or meta level. So in addition to thinking about things at, in the particular level, it thinks about things at higher levels. In fact, one of the primary questions of philosophy is of what truth is and why we should believe in true things. So uh, this, is, this abstract or meta level content is something that's, I think, very distinguishing of philosophy. There are various central issues in philosophy. For instance, the question of what is there? What things exist in the universe or what things should we ratify? That's a question of ontology, mainly in the area of philosophy known as metaphysics. In epistemology, the main question is how do we know things? Or even the question of whether we know anything. Skeptics have denied that we know anything about the world at all. In more practical terms, ethics and practical philosophy has considered the questions of how to live or, or questions about value, what should we care about? So these are the kinds of general abstract or meta-level questions that philosophy generally deals in. Philosophy also thinks about particular areas of human inquiry. In philosophy of science, for instance, there are a bunch of philosophy of X's where X is a particular science. So there's a philosophy of physics, a philosophy of biology, and what I'm going to talk to you today about is philosophy of neuroscience. So let's think about neuroscience. What is neuroscience? So neuroscience is clearly an area of natural sciences, and it's really a group of disciplines that's related in that they share the goals of describing and understanding and manipulating the nervous system. So neuroscientists work to understand the way that brains and nervous systems more generally work. And there are lots of ways that they uh, explore the nervous system. So some explore the structure of nervous systems. Some are interested in how neurons and neural networks function. Some are interested in understanding the way in which we think, cognition. Some work to understand non-human non nervous systems and some aim to understand and treat diseases of the nervous system. Most of the questions, at least most of the important questions in neuroscience involve understanding nervous systems at many levels, and so it requires the integration across these levels to really get at the answers we care about. So if you think about the brain as the proverbial elephant with a lot of blind men uh, feeling different parts of it, you might think that individual neuroscientists are like those blind men trying to understand little bits of the big picture, and the question is how to put all those bits together. Let me tell you about some subfields of neuroscience for you to get a better understanding of what neuroscientists do and the kinds of problems that they face. 
Neuroanatomy is the study of the structure of the nervous system. You might think that that's an easy problem. It's pretty easy to see structure in a lot of other things in the world. However, the brain looks like an undifferentiated blob of tissue when you look at it with your bare eyes. And even when you look under a microscope, there's not much to see until you start using special tools to try to differentiate different parts of the nervous system. So there are different kinds of dyes that dye particular types of cells. We've invented different kinds of tracers that trace different kinds of neural pathways. Neuroanatomists have come up with lots of different tools that allow them to look at individual parts of the nervous system piecemeal and try to make a picture out of that of what the nervous system is structured like. But you might be really surprised to know that neuroscientists still don't understand the total structure of the human brain, despite decades of research. Neurophysiology, in contrast, is the study of how the nervous system works, and in particular, an attempt to characterize the electrical principles and the signals that it uses in order to compute or do whatever uh, kinds of functions the nervous system does. So in neurophysiology, for instance, Neuroscientists have developed methods of recording from single cells, even though single cells are microns wide. Cellular neuroscience is different in that the cellular neuroscientists are interested in biological questions about how the cells of the nervous system function, whether they be neurons or glia. What is the source of energy for these cells? How do they traffic proteins up and down their axons? How do they get rid of waste? Uh, how do the organelles in the cells function? Molecular neuroscience, on the other hand, is concerned with the molecular mechanisms of neural function. So every cell in your body has a nucleus with DNA, but the DNA expressed in neurons is different than the DNA that's expressed in other cells. And molecular neuroscientists are interested in how the DNA in neurons functions uh, what kinds of products are produced, what kinds of pathways they take part in, and in general, what goes on at the molecular level inside of neurons. On the other end of the spectrum is systems neuroscientists. So in systems neuroscience, people are concerned with how large-scale circuits in brains function. How do you get complex behavior out of the interacting parts of lots of brain, the brain? And closely related but different to systems neuroscience is cognitive neuroscience, which is really interested in systems neuroscience at the human level. What kinds of systems underlie our cognition? Uh, not just ours, we're interested in cognition in general, but how do these systems function in order to produce cognitive behavior? Cognitive neuroscientists are faced with an additional problem uh, that doesn't necessarily face systems neuroscientists, and that is that they are working largely with human beings, and there are limits to what kinds of techniques can be used with human beings. So they largely have to work with tools that are non-invasive, and neuroimaging has emerged as a major tool in trying to understand cognition. So cognitive neuroscience is a nice uh, bridge between human neuropsychology and uh, neuroscience. So now that I've characterized both philosophy and neuroscience for you, um, you might wonder again, how is it that they interact at all? One is this abstract discipline that's not empirical, and this other one is a completely empirical natural science. But in fact, these two disciplines do interact, and there are a number of areas in which they intersect. So the first area of intersection that we'll discuss is philosophy of neuroscience. I will just give you a preview of the areas of intersection that we're going to discuss in the following uh, videos. So first is philosophy of neuroscience. Philosophy of neuroscience is really one of the philosophy of X's, where X is one of the disciplines of human inquiry. Uh, although, philosophy, although neuroscience is closely related to biology, it is a type of biology, philosophy of neuroscience is typically quite different practiced than philosophy of biology. The questions that philosophers of neuroscience ask 
are usually quite different from the questions that philosophers of biology ask. So while philosophers of biology are largely concerned with questions of evolution, philosophers of neuroscience are concerned with other questions about how brains come to represent the world and the kinds of methods that are particular to neuroscience. So that will be the subject of the next video. Neurophilosophy, on the other hand, tries to apply neuroscientific insights to problems that are traditional problems in philosophy of mind. And our second video will talk more about that. And then finally, uh, Walter Sinnott Armstrong will present a video on neuroethics, which is really where ethics meets neuroscience. So neuroscience is an empirical discipline, but it's performed on people and animals. And so there are ethical considerations. And it turns out that because the brain is really the seat of who we are, the kinds of ethical problems raised in neuroscience are distinct and go beyond those that are typically involved. Uh, in just other biological questions. So that is the end of part one, and we will see you again in part two of the neural uh, beginner's guide to neural mechanisms.